to glory, fill our hearts, oh God. We ask that your glory fill our hearts. Yeah. Oh, let your glory. We ask that your glory fill our hearts. Yeah. Just like a rushing wind, come fill our hearts, oh God. Just like the rushing wind, come fill our hearts, oh God. Just like the day of Pentecost, let your presence fill the room. Just like the day of Pentecost, let your presence fill this room. Let your glory fill my heart, my power. Let your glory fill my heart, my power. Let your glory.
Let your glory fill our heart, my power. Let your glory fill our heart, my power. Let your glory fill our heart, my power. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us into yet another opportunity to learn at your feet. Father, breathe upon your word. Father, let your word be a lamp unto our feet. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. My brothers, my sisters, wherever you are, all over the world, we welcome you. We say good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Today we come to the 13th part of the series, Getting It Right. The topic of our session today is... It is deeper than we think or that we see. For those who are watching either on YouTube or Facebook, you can see this tree in front of us. To the normal person, all we see are the leaves and the stem. We do not see the massive network of roots going deep, deep, deep down. Sometimes, the root may even be deeper than the height of the tree. What does this mean? It means that when people have an habit, when people are struggling with something, what we, looking at them, are seeing is just part of the picture. So many times, the problem goes beyond what we are seeing. The problems may even go beyond what they think it is. So today, as we've been doing for the past few weeks, we'll break our discussions into some sections. Since today is part 13, permit me to let us examine in 13 sections. Now, we have been looking at trying to overcome our issues that we are struggling with. I'm talking today to someone who is serious about breaking a bad habit that the person has. It is important we look at it in a very, very deep perspective. Let's begin by looking at four different scenarios. So, the first one of the 13 aspects is that we are seeing the problem in perspective. Let's take the case of a man called John. This John is involved in extramarital relationship. He had tried so many times to break this relationship. He has prayed to God to give him strength to overcome he has been fasting, he has been telling people to pray with him. He was feeling guilty, he had fear. He eventually, he was exposed. As hard as he tried, his wife knew about it, the family knew about it. It led to a divorce of his marriage, resulting in hurt, resulting in shame to both families. Let's take another person. Ade is a truck driver. He was driving a Dangote truck. He was a heavy smoker. He was smoking Indian ham, smoking anything smokable. He was smoking. The wife didn't like it. And he promised the wife that he would stop. And surely he started decreasing the quantity from being a heavy smoker. He became a light smoker. And he was hopeful that it will end. However, it couldn't end. He's still smoking. 
In fact, his smoking is even worse now. Let's take a third case of a lady. You can call her any name. Let's call her Susan. Now, she had a husband, but the husband died early. And then she remarried. She married someone who is supposed to be a Christian. And they were married together. They've been together for 20 years plus. All of a sudden, she discovered that the man she thought is a Christian had another wife somewhere, had other children somewhere. To cut the long story short, the second marriage broke another divorce. Let's take the last case. A man this time. He has a very short temper. Any little thing, he will shout, he will do all sorts of things, he will break into a tantrum. In fact, there was a particular day, he even beat his wife. He regretted beating his wife. He asked God for deliverance. He felt humiliated. He felt guilt-ridden. Now, he too was praying. He was asking God for help. But after trying so many times, he gave up. He said, I can't help myself. That's the way we are in our family. My father had a short temper. My grandfather had a short temper. My sister beats her own husband. So at least I'm trying. I only beat my wife once. Now, this leads us to the second session, which is what went wrong in all these uh, situations. Now, all these four people in the scenario, they were all Christians. They were all praying. They recognized they had a problem. They were praying to be delivered. But somehow, in all the four cases, there was no deliverance. They were still with the problem. In one case, the problem even ended up worse than it began. So what this is trying to show us is that apparently being sincere to solve your problem does not appear a guarantee to bring deliverance. That it is not always enough that someone has recognized that, oh, I have this problem. I have this habit. I don't want the habit again. That recognition, the sincere recognition, appears to be insufficient. This takes us to the top topic we are looking at, the subtopic, which says that we sometimes misunderstand the full extent of the problem. You see, one reason why all these people reverted to their old behavior pattern is that they mistook the extent of the problem they are contending with. You know, when we started, we showed a tree. We showed that the tree, we could only see not the whole thing. We saw only what was on top. We were not seeing the root. And as we can see from the picture we are showing now, what is unseen is actually more complicated than what we were seeing. Yes, it is true they wanted victory, but they didn't understand how they would achieve the victory. They wanted to overcome a particular habit for their own benefit. They wanted to be free of the symptoms of their problem, but they did not carry out a thorough examination that will reveal the hidden depth, that will reveal the deeper perspectives of the problems in their lives. This leads us to the, third, to the fourth one, which says that this thing is like the tip of a iceberg. For those watching on Facebook and uh, YouTube, you can see the picture of a iceberg here. You will see that the hidden part of the iceberg is much, much bigger than the part we were looking at. In the case before us, John wanted to break 
an adulterous relationship. He wanted to break it just because he was feeling guilty. He didn't want people to know that he had that problem. He didn't want to be discovered. Now, he was seeking for God's assistance to save his marriage and above all, to save his reputation. Of course, this is understandable. We can all identify with him. We can pity him. But the problem is more than just his reputation. The problem is just more, is more than just people discovering that he had an extramarital affair. His life required more adjustments. To begin with, in this particular case, this man had a hot temper. He had other complications that nobody was talking about. He had problems with money. He had problems lying. He had so many other things. And the issue of the extramarital affairs was just like an escape mechanism for him. So, until the other matters are addressed, until those other underlying things are confronted, the problem will still be there. This leads us to the fifth aspect of our discussion today, which is that what exactly is God's concern? Now, what is God's interest? When a child of God has these issues, what does God want? That he just stops having an adulterous relationship? Yes, but much more than that. God seeing all the other underlying factors. In the case of this man, apart from the issue of extramarital relationship, God wanted him to humble himself. He was a proud man. God wanted him to, he says, God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. God wanted him to apologize to his wife. He didn't want to do that. He didn't even want the wife to know anything. God wanted him to apologize to his children, to reorganize his priorities, to address his attitude. The pride needed to be broken. The selfishness he had needed to be faced head on. More importantly, God was not number one in his life. God wanted to become number one in his life. But this brother, this John, he wasn't concerned about all those things. All he just wanted was, let me be free of this relationship. He just wanted to sweep the dirt under the carpet. But God wanted to do a thorough cleaning of his life. Now, this leads us to the next one, the sixth point we are looking at, which is that Many times, we only want to use God. We are just interested in solving our own problems. We are not interested in doing things on God's terms. Now, a child of God that has a smoking problem, he only wants God to remove the smoking from his life because the doctors told him that, See, the way you are smoking, in a few years, your lungs will be affected, you may die. That was his motivation. He didn't really care so much about God. His concern was not God. He was just concerned about his health. And he just wanted God to deliver him from the smoking. But there were so many other things wrong with his life. Even though he's a Christian, he doesn't read this Bible. He doesn't go to church. I'm sure many of us know some people who though are professing to be Christians, they don't read the Bible. They don't go to church. They don't do all the things they are meant to do as Christians. But because maybe they have a health issue, they are just seeking for deliverance from that. What about all the other problems in their lives? 
Many of them are not willing. Many of them are not ready for God to address all the problems they have. And until you are ready to do things on God's terms. He says, he makes all things beautiful in his time, not your own time. He does things on his own terms. So, these people we have looked at, they failed because they were not ready to operate on the terms of God. God didn't deliver Susan from bitterness because deep within, she had some other long-standing struggles unrelated to her husband's issue. She was nervous, she was fearful, she had a history of nagging her husband and nagging the children, abusing the children. Her present bitterness was inflamed with self-pity. And that was one sin she was not prepared to part with. She was enjoying the self-pity. And that leads us to our seventh point. Are you prepared to stop it? Are you truly prepared to stop? Because you see, many times we meet Christians, either when they come for counseling or when you are discussing with them, that they have something that they enjoy. They enjoy pity party. They like people, ah, pele, pele, pele. That thing they are saying pele for, they are enjoying it. They don't want to let go. So, while we are trying to help them solve what appeared the main problem, there are some other things under that they are enjoying and they are not willing to let go of. This leads us to the number eight one, which is, the underlying attitude. You see, a reason why many children of God lack solutions to the problem is because of their unwillingness to face the underlying attitude towards God. What is your attitude to God? How do you see God? You see, many of the people that are going through all these things they have a personal struggle with God. They don't have a good relationship with God. Many of them are rebelling against God. Many of them are not submissive to God. Until a child of God accepts himself and his place in the world with joyful thanksgiving, he will never learn to control his temper. He will always feel that he's shortchanged, that God is not giving him what he deserves. God is concerned about changing these underlying things. But many of the people we see, many of the people we meet that have these problems, they are not concerned. They are not prepared about addressing those underlying problems. They want victory over just the surface. They don't want to be embarrassed. They don't want people to know what they are doing. But they are not prepared to change and to look for permanent solution. This leads us to the ninth uh, subtopic today, which is that we must face the issues. We need to face the issues if we want to have a permanent uh, solution. How easily we want freedom from a particular sin without facing the basic issues. One day, a man that had just lost his job, he called to say, oh, they fired me from job, this one, that one. Uh, what can I do? How do I get over the thing? You know, he started going for counseling on how he can get another job, this, that, that, that. Meanwhile, shortly after, a lady called also, seeking for help, seeking for counsel on how to end an affair with a married man, 
only to discover it was that man that lost his job that is involved in extramarital relationship with this woman. So, while you, there is a saying in some African languages that you are living leprosy and you are only treating just a small problem, a scratch on your skin. So, many times, the problems people give us the impression they have is small compared to other ones that are hidden beneath. This leads us to the tenth subtopic today, which is that, okay, having said all this, what does God want to achieve? What does God want to accomplish? Now, in the life of all his children, God has a larger purpose in wanting to show us our inner self. Unfortunately, we are too often unwilling to cooperate with God. Many times, the deeper issue we avoid is our rebellion against God. A man may be dishonest in business. A woman may have had an issue she doesn't even want to discuss, something hidden. And both of them are having conscience problems. But they are not willing to deal with the basic attitude of defiance of God's authority. They are resisting God. They are not in agreement with God concerning their secret lives. They are not in agreement with what God demands of them about how they manage their time, how they manage their money, how they relate with people. But they want the same God who they are not agreeing with. They want him to now solve just one problem. They want him to leave all these other ones. Come and solve this one. Little wonder that God does not agree. Because you cannot deceive God. You cannot use God. God cannot be mocked. That's what the Bible says. That you shall reap what you have sown. Now, as we gradually begin to round up, let's look at the 11th uh, sub-point, which is that repentance, genuine repentance, is not always easy. You see, to confess our sins, it means we are agreeing with God that what we have done is wrong. It also means that we are agreeing that we don't want to do it again. Now, those who confess their sins but are not ready to stop it, they are still secretly intending to repeat the same thing. They cannot be said to be fully repentant. Now, such incomplete repentance leads to repeated failure. So they will still just be struggling and it will now appear as if they are praying, but God is not answering their prayers. Meanwhile, they are not repentant. They are not ready to let go. And there is a proverb that says, for those who have lies on their head, that until all the lies are killed. You see, when we were young, when a child has a lie on his head, he will remove it, bring it to his nail, knee, um, what do you call it? And kill it like that with your nail. So there is a proverb that until all the lies on the head are fully killed, there will still be blood on the nails. So until the underlying issues are addressed, until, and many times those ones are more serious than the ones that are visible, until those ones are addressed, there will be no permanent solution. This takes us to the 12th subtopic. It says that don't stop here. God wants to draw, to draw you to himself. You see, the ultimate desire of God is not to condemn us. The ultimate desire of God is not to embarrass us. The Bible tells us that God does not desire any sinner to die. God wants everybody to come to repentance. God wants everybody to be made whole. 
For example, he says he's coming for a church without spot, without wrinkle. So if I have 20 areas where my life is contrary to God's standard, God is not just interested in one of the 20 that you are seeing. He's interested in all. He wants me to overcome all the 20. He wants me to cooperate with him, to solve all, so that I am fully in alignment with him, so that I agree with him totally on his word and on his ways by solving the problem. Fortunately, to the glory of God, many people who are willing to accept God's terms, no matter how complicated their lives are, once they are willing, God is able, abundantly able, to deliver all sorts of bad habits, no matter how they may appear. The final one we are looking at today, the 13th one, is that all these things we go through, bad habits, weaknesses, they are a challenge to display God's grace and God's power. No matter how sinful a person can be, there is no habit that the grace of God cannot break. He says, though your sins be like scarlet, they can become as white as snow. We have met so many people who had been involved in many things. Some have been arm robbers. Some have been drug addicts. Some have been stealing money. But when you cooperate with God, when you surrender, you say, just as I am, you are willing to open every aspect of your life. You are willing for his tool of panel beating, to panel beat every rough area of your life. That is when God's power will show. So, like we said, the challenges we go through, our temptations, our weaknesses, all these areas of struggles, they are an opportunity for God to display his grace, to display his power. I will end with James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. That one tells us that, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience. But let patience have a perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. So, my brothers, my sisters, God uses our struggles to give us a thorough house cleaning, to reorganize our priorities, and to make us dependent on his grace. There are no cheap, easy miracles. There are no cheap, easy solutions. All solutions provided by God must be on his own terms, not our terms. And I pray that someone listening to me today has learned something. And that as we cooperate with God, those areas we have still covered up, those areas we are not willing to let go, God is interested in them. He wants a thorough cleaning. He wants to thoroughly work on us. He wants to perfect us. And I pray God will perfect you. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. Shall we pray? He says that it is God that works in us, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. God will continue to walk in me. He will walk in you. He will walk in us to accomplish his desires, to accomplish his will for our lives. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. See you again same time next week. Till then, bye-bye. God bless you. All the best. Thanks for watching today's episode of our special Digging Deep. For questioning on any of our Bible study topics, kindly send a message to 080-9975-1014, WhatsApp only, or send a mail to 
RCCG Temple of God Parish at gmail.com. Oh, wow.